I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. There's a question that came in on the chat that I'd like to speak to before I get into my main topic about energy. Not in the, I don't know, cosmic sense, but more like being vigorous or diligent or determined in your own practice, that kind of energy. Pers pers persistence and perseverance. Um, people ask me from time to time, what do I think about the teachings that you can find here and there, that what a person should do is pick one thing, one tradition, one teacher, one guru, one practice, and go deep into it. What do I think about that? Uh, well, I think most fundamentally, the answer to that question, much as the Buddha put it, is to observe the results. And I think generally that there's a distinction to be made between dabbling and depth. And there's a place for dabbling. You know, you sampling a lot of different kinds of food to decide what you like or different exercises. Uh, a while ago when I was seeking a therapist, I did a session with three different people ended up with one. Uh, there's a place for checking stuff out. But if we're using dabbling as a way to, as instead of something that actually has traction for us and produces results, that's not so good. I myself am not that worried about people being somehow confused by being exposed to different traditions. I think it's okay, and I sort of trust people. I trust you, I trust myself to listen to different teachers, to observe the results, to try different practices, and to integrate different things that work for you in your own fundamental path. In that context, I think it's useful to have a home base. As you've probably noticed, in terms of my contemplative life, my home base is early Buddhism, the original teachings of the Buddha, including as they've evolved to some extent in the Theravadan tradition that is centered more in Southeast Asia. I'm not against any other traditions. I've actually gotten a lot of value in the last 10 years or so from more of Mahayana influence, Tibetan, Chan, Zen influences. Um, but in terms of my Buddhist practice, I'm, I'm pretty centered in the straightforward, pragmatic, not airy-fairy, not kind of hard to understand, usually, teachings of the Buddha, the direct teachings, which I'm going to share some of which, some, some of them with you tonight. Um, that said, uh, from that solid place, wow, why not branch out? Why not be open? Why not play with all the toys and trust yourself that you're not going to be getting confused. Uh, anyway, that's my two cents. Now I'd like to talk with you about the factors of awakening and the third in the traditional list of these, uh, energy or determination, diligence, perseverance. And you can apply this to other things you might want to be more sustained about, such as exercise, eating in a certain way, or cultivating a kind of resilient core inside yourself that helps you experience stable well-being in unstable times. So, energy. And I'm not totally happy with that word because it can mean different things. Uh, the truth is a lot of people are grappling with chronic fatigue. Or just a day, a regular day just, just wears you out because it's crazy and we're running around and you know we're not fed very much. So eventually we run on empty, right? We, we're not refueling ourselves. So maybe instead of energy, we could think in terms of a kind of resolve, a certain purposefulness, a certain application again and again and again for your own sake, to protect yourself, to shore yourself up, to nurture yourself, to nourish yourself, and to keep on going. That's really what we're talking about here, keeping on going in your own path of awakening. Uh, 
As you may know from the beginning to my book, Neuroderma, I talk about friends of mine on the trail uh, or on the rock climb who are farther along. Maybe they're a little better at it than I am, maybe a little more fit than I am or a lot more fit. And then they turn toward me and say, hey, come on, keep going. It's okay. Come on up. And I think of uh, great teachers doing much the same. Farther up, let's say, up the mountain of awakening, but they turn to us with this gentle, encouraging smile. Come on, you can do it. Keep, keep going. You may need to catch your breath. It's okay. I understand. <sighs> you may have to put your hands on your knees and take some deep breaths. You may need to you know, drink some water, eat some food, look around. You may need to get a good night's rest. But then when you gather yourself a little bit, come on. And they beckon us onward. They beckon us onward to join them. It's that spirit of keep going. So that's what I want to talk about. That's what I want to talk about. Uh, the context of this, of course, is the notion of the two wheels of the cart of practice. This is a traditional metaphor. In other words, there is a place for gradual development and the spirit, the motivation to keep on going in your practice and for your life in general is very related to gradual development. It's a necessary factor for gradual development to stay motivated to keep developing gradually. Alongside that wheel, that track in the path of awakening, is true nature already. Underneath it all, you might have experienced this during the meditation. I was really happy to say I did. Um, you could just feel an underlying ground of being in you. You can be aware of a kind of core inside yourself that's always all right wakeful, undisturbed in the core, peaceful, radiant, content, and rested in love, deep down inside, true nature. Maybe that true nature then starts spreading out into the whole universe, even into what might be mysteriously transcendental. Both are true. I'm going to focus on the first of these, but let's be clear that it's not the whole story. And one thing that can certainly help us keep on going is a sense of the other wheel, the other track in the card of practice, that which is your underlying true nature already. And I'll get to this a little bit later on that one of the ways to relate to keeping on going is in terms of what pulls us, what draws us, rather than the sticks behind us that we're moving away from. And one of the things that can keep drawing us onward in our practice is, is a sense of the beautiful, um, wonderful, good news that is already true. Now to be clear, that underlying true nature does not um, mean that people cannot be real jerks and horrible, evil, cruel, callous, terrible, brutal. And this true nature stuff does not mean that there are not leaky faucets to fix and hungry children to feed. No, but just simply to be observed directly, experienced directly for yourself as you can, increasingly probably over time, to have a sense of both of these wheels, both of these tracks in your own ongoing path of awakening. That's a framework here. So um, the term in Pali for this is virya. Um, actually, that's Sanskrit. Virya, sounds very similar, is Pali. And other translations or other words for it are things like diligence, enthusiasm, I like that one, uh, exertion, persistence, persevering, vigor. 
Uh, it's the notion of gladly, gladly, not out of grim, uh, beating yourself up, pressuring yourself. There's a gladness in this kind of uh, perseverance. And I'll be getting to what supports this kind of energy. So there's a gladness, there's a stability. Um, what helps you meditate at least a minute or more a day? What helps you be committed to disentangling yourself from that case in your mind against other people or someone in particular? Right? What helps you do that? That's what we're talking about here. Gladness can help you do that. Determination can help you do that. Resolve can help you do that. That's what we're talking about. In the Abhidhamma, which is a fundamental uh, Buddhist text uh, developing multiple centuries after the Buddha passed away, it is said that this quality that's a factor of awakening and we can develop inside ourselves, this quality to develop inside yourself, um, it's, it's a mind intent on being active, not inert. You know, like, uh, nothing I could do. You know, not being defeated, in other words. Being active, devoted. There's a devotional quality. Devoted. You could feel it emotionally. Devoted, zeal. I see Elaine, exactly. Yes, devoted, unshaken in, in your determination, your fundamental determination, even if you need to take a break from time to time. Not turning back. Sticking with it. I think about <clears throat> my dad growing up on a ranch in North Dakota, born in 1918, three siblings, um, his mom and dad, and the culture around them. And the thing that I saw when I would visit them very often is that um, the people there on the ranch, uh, they just kept going. They didn't rush about. They weren't stressing themselves, but they kept going. They kept mending fences, tending to horses, gathering the eggs from the chicken coops, uh, planting the vegetables in their garden, uh, mending, uh, gathering wood for the fire in the cold winter. They kept going. It's that spirit, right? Okay. So, and then I love this line here. This quality realizes and perfects what is conducive to the positive. So we're building in our practice. We're developing. And we're developing that which is positive, that which is beneficial, and typically also that which is enjoyable as well. Because usually that which is beneficial for us is enjoyable. Not always. Not all enjoyable things are beneficial and not all beneficial things are enjoyable. But generally speaking, the enjoyability of something um, is a clue that it's probably beneficial too. Okay. So to finish some of this Buddhist stuff, and then I'm going to get into practicalities and then open it up uh, to your questions and comments. Um, <clears throat> you may know, as I said before we kind of formally began tonight, that there are multiple lists in, in early Buddhism of, you know, the five strengths or the five spiritual faculties as well, the 10 or six perfections, the paramis or paramitas. And you'll find that this quality of energy, determination, application, persistence, fueled by gladness, uh, is in all of them. It's a real factor. Um, I remember this teaching from Joseph Goldstein when I was sitting on a retreat in which he was a teacher. He said, the way he put it in his kind of <laughs> austere way, upright and austere and vigorous, Joseph, uh, those are traditional terms that are complementary. Uh, he uh, said, here in a retreat, it's good to be relaxed, but not casual. 
In other words, don't be a slacker. Be relaxed. Don't be hard on yourself. But keep going. Keep going. And most of us know what the realistic increase is for us in our diligence and practice. We may know that it's just not our life structure to be able to take 10 days in silent retreat every year. We may know that. We may know that in our life structure, uh, given everything, you know, setting aside 45 minutes in the morning for meditation, it's just not realistic. While also, often we know, we know that we really could take a minute or two before falling asleep to sort of reset, to settle in, and to come home to ourselves. And that might be good for us. We, we know we really could at least one meal a day to look at the food on our plate, consider where it came from, have a sense of, um, you know, the connectedness uh, with everything represented by what's on our plate and that we're taking it in and we too are part of this larger process with gratitude. You know, we could do that. We know we could do that. We know we could, in this range from here to there, we could move up there. Or maybe something I'm, you know, it's kind of a growing edge for me working on is being engaged in a way that's kind of amusing to me with how rapidly can I disengage from my, like a contracted reactivity that's entangling with someone or something and uh, come home to a little bit of a saying I have for myself, mind like water, mind like air, frictionless, while still saying what needs to be said, doing what needs to be done. How rapidly, right, can you disentangle in real terms, including from people who matter a lot to you? Maybe that's that extra bit. So we usually know, what is that extra amount? Okay, what would help you? Apply yourself in that way really fundamental. We probably also know what that extra little bit would be in what we eat each day. Maybe morally moving away from animal-based products or for health reasons, for the sake of the climate and the whole planet. Maybe there's a movement there. Maybe we know that um, it's important to get something substantial in our bellies before drinking too much coffee. I work on that one. Uh, maybe we know that it's just not that good for us to eat past seven or so, or you know, it, or we to to eat less than three or four hours before we actually go to bed. We know that that's actually important for us, whatever that might be. No finger wagging here, you know. It's just what you know. Okay, what would help you take that next step? Because that's so much that increment is so much, again and again and again, what makes all the difference in the upward trend, potentially, of your life. That little bit. I got to admit it, I recently <laughs> rewatched Any Given Sunday, the Oliver Stone film with Al Pacino in it, and there's a really intense locker room scene where Al Pacino, being Al Pacino, he's a football coach, is you know, giving a speech and kind of ranting to his team. You can find it on YouTube in which he talks about inches, that inch. Now he puts it in a way that's very football saturated and clawing. And I don't think the Buddha would approve. A lot of craving in there. That said, that difference again and again and again, and having the application, the energy, the vigor, the resolve toward that increment day after day after day makes such a huge difference. And then you go to bed. And you, you, you feel, you know, good on you. A solid day's <laughs> effort, a solid day's work, right? You respect yourself. Okay. Not shaming yourself, not shaming yourself, respecting yourself. So how do we do it? How do we do it? And how do we um, stay on the path or the stay on the track of the good qualities? of persistence and diligence and 
resolution, determination, without falling into the classic pitfalls of beating ourselves up, criticizing ourselves, pressuring ourselves, you know, putting that stick in our own back, right? How do we do it? So I want to talk about some key elements here. And first, I want to introduce a story uh, that from the, I believe, Bhagavad Gita. And someone who knows Hinduism better than I do can help me here. Uh, this is the story, to summarize, of Krishna and the gopis. This story is culturally situated. It's gendered in certain kinds of ways. Okay. Uh, and see for yourself what speaks to you. So Krishna, as a manifestation of the divine, the ultimate, of, of certain qualities, being extremely appealing, very attractive, playing music, drawing people, just wonderful. And Krishna starts playing his pipes, I guess. And nearby somewhere are these cow herds, these women who are watching the cattle. And the cattle can be understood as the sort of conventional um, preoccupations of our, of our minds. Nothing particularly exalted there. Okay. And then Krishna starts playing his music. And what do the gopis do? They just turn away from their cows and they're drawn to Krishna. They're drawn to Krishna. And it's not that somebody has to tell them, oh, cows are bad. Don't do cows. They're just attracted to what is beneficial, to what is noble, to what is potentially profound. They're drawn in that direction. And I've thought about that a lot, including raising adolescents, and I've made certainly mistakes there. And I've thought about it in general. It's so much more effective over time to be drawn toward the light than to fear the darkness. So much more effective over time to be almost pulled by a current or carried along by a current um, toward what you long for, toward what you care most about. And so that's the spirit here in talking about increasing energy and diligence and application for your inner, for your practice, your contemplative practice, your path of awakening, and for your life in general. It's this principle of attraction. And you might ask yourself how you motivate yourself. Do you tend to motivate yourself by preventing the negative or moving away from pain or what is problematic? That's a form of motivation. Sometimes it's necessary. You know, you run out of the burning building. Um, it's because it's burning. Okay, I get that. But on the whole, it's tiring. It's stressful. Um, it feels like you're being pressured. It's a lot easier to feel inspired, to feel enthused. The root of the word enthusiasm is endeos in Greek, God within, the divine within, that which is beautiful within, calling us forward, right? Much more effective. So let's think about that for a moment. What prevents you or what blocks you from being drawn toward what you love in the most profound sense? That's a really simple but important question. If I were to answer it honestly, I would say, well, weariness. Weariness that comes from solving a lot of problems, doing a lot of things that are worth doing, but still in the aggregate can uh, make me too tired to be really given over to what most inspires me most matters. How about you? Anger, resentments, being pissed off about this or that, that can get in the way of what you're most drawn toward. You might think about, how can I release or disengage from what blocks me? Maybe it's other people. Maybe it's certain activities. Maybe it's, you know, Drinking too much alcohol, which is a toxin and a sedative, just, bleh, you know, 
clouds the mind, as the Buddha taught. Um, you know, what gets in your way of being drawn toward what you most love, what you most care about? I see Brenda writing here. So appreciate your comments, Brenda, all the time. Quotidian responsibilities. In other words, mundane, everyday, pedestrian, quotidian responsibilities. Um, and you might think about what could you do to make more room in your life for what most draws your heart? It's a pretty existential question, you know, when we're all sitting there on the porch in the last year or so, or lying there in bed in the last month or week or day or so. Looking back, what are we going to wish we had made room for, given ourselves over to? Treated as more precious in our lives. These are the questions that come up around this topic of virya, persistence, energy. Specifically, to feed the sources of these qualities of enthusiasm and motivation, right? It really is important to take care of the body. The more I engage the software of the mind and the spirit, the more I appreciate the hardware of our physiology, especially as we age. You know, you look around the Zoom windows here, most, most of us, me included, are probably past or are getting close to the midline of our lifespan. And you know, as you get older, the body becomes more and more important to really take good care of. So think about things that give you energy in your body and treating it seriously. If you have a nagging health complaint and not just kicking that can down the road, or given you know, the health care you have access to, being realistic about it, um, doing the best you can at least to be taken seriously and to get good assessments as best you can and um, you know, doing common sense health practices as well. Uh, so take care of your body, it's really important. A lot of times depressed mood is a symptom of some kind of untreated health condition that may not be enough to put you in the hospital, but is less than optimum radiant wellness, okay? Take care of the body. Another source of energy is good company. That's why it's so wonderful that you're here with me, that we're here with each other. And we have opportunities once a week and also in everyday life to uh, think about, you know, who lifts you up, disengaging from who drags you down. You know, we can put a lot of energy into wrangling with some troll or trying to convince some person to budge one millimeter. Whew. Often much better to find good company with others, even if it's in the solitude of your own reading, where you experience good company with wisdom traditions or fiction writers that you really, you really enjoy and get fed by. Uh, good company. That's really important. Maybe your good company is your pet. Is your, is your cat, your dog, your friend, your parakeet. Um, I find good company with some of the, at this point, really large goldfish that have gradually grown in the wild, in the pond in our backyard, here on the edge of open space in San Rafael, um, protected from the raccoons that would love to eat them. Uh, that's I like them. They're my company sometimes. Enthusiasm. <clears throat> Protecting enthusiasms. It's so easy to let others rain on her parade or to have internalized those who did rain on your parade when you were young. You know, can you be out with your enthusiasm for your personal practice? You know, can you be out with the fact that you've made room in your life at least once a week for something contemplative? Right? And what is it like to feel enthusiastic? and to let yourself be enthusiastic rather than all bottled up and tame and throttled down and looking over your shoulder and you know playing small. There are probably lots of reasons for that if you are, no blame. But going forward, oof, enthusiasm. And finding practices that you can be enthusiastic about. You know, if you're just repeating the same prayer, the same catechism, 
you know, the same teaching and it's like kind of rote. Well, not, much, not very enthusiastic. You know, what are the practices that are juicy, that are emotionally rich for you, that are positive, that feel good? Draw your enthusiasm. That's a major factor also of sticking with it that we're talking about. Then there's the part about our, uh, honoring the light within you, the fires within you. Uh, in other words, I find very often that if people have a chance to just step out of the quotidian rat race, maybe it's just taking, if you, you know, in your life, a little bit of time for yourself, maybe an hour maybe less, where you just step out of the rat race and you reflect and you just make yourself take that time. Maybe you find your way to a beach. You just sit there looking at the ocean. Maybe you sit outside at night and you look up at the sky, the stars. Maybe if you have time, you uh, set aside a, a morning or a day for practice. Maybe you go on a retreat for over a weekend or for a week or 10 days. And you really listen to what is deep inside you that you really, really care about deeply and, and honor it. That can be really profound. I remember the very first time I went on a retreat and I came home and said to my kids, nothing is as powerful as nothing. <laughs> they laughed. Sure, dad, what? <laughs> it's true. Just that space and what emerges into that space is often some of the most beautiful, wisest parts of yourself. The deepest, truest voices in your own being. And can we listen to them? and be given over to them, be guided by them. That's a, that will really help us find this energy. And then the last I'll say here is about consistency, boring consistency. Every day, right? Every day, maybe every meal. If you look at the hallmarks, of monastic practice, people who really dedicate themselves across all traditions in the world, including those of the indigenous people around the world. What's the hallmark of dedicated, serious practice in the, the people who most set it as, most focus on it? It's consistency. What's the hallmark of high levels of attainment in any area in you know physical fitness uh, technical skill as a surgeon uh, you know being really wonderful as a preschool teacher it's consistency excellence in cooking you know consistency so can you make room for consistency in your life in your practice whatever that you care about uh, you know, for me, there are certain things that uh, have really mattered a lot to be consistent about, like establishing my, my life's purpose I, again each morning as I before I get out of bed, um, saying certain things to my wife uh, every night. Uh, consistency. Doing something contemplative every day. That's important to me. Consistency. Uh, Admitting fault <laughs> consistently, very important. What do you want to be consistent about? And how can your consistency, which might take a certain will, willpower, but then it becomes a habit. There's a kind of tipping point when your consistency becomes easier and easier and it becomes hard to budge your consistency. Uh, it's easier to be consistent than to not be consistent over time. What do you want to be more consistent about? In your spiritual practice, in your meditation, in your life altogether. Okay. 
So just to remind you, the seven factors of awakening are mindfulness, investigation, energy or effort, uh, bliss, I'm going to talk about that next, wow, tranquility, whoa, concentration, including non-ordinary states of awareness, strap on your seatbelt there, talk about the jhanas, and then equanimity, equanimity, those seven. So we've spoken through the first three, mindfulness, investigation, and effort. Uh, and we're going to keep going next with really cool stuff about bliss. And I'll bring in another related, I think, serious factor, uh, happiness, sweetness, contentment. Okay. So any questions or comments so far? What do you think about this? This is probably, this factor is probably the most embarrassing <laughs> to take a hard look at because it's, you know, it's a mirror, right? Um, and it's maybe one of the factors, perhaps the factor that is most uh, down and down to earth with a lot of practical implications. Okay. So I'm seeing lots of comments coming in, um, lots of graded you know, teachings for other people. That's great. Um, let's see, anybody want to ask me a specific question related to what we're uh, talking about here? Wholesome effort is really what we're talking about. Wholesome effort. If you want to uh, talk with me directly, put your hand up. I see Ruby. Excellent. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Here we go. You have to unmute yourself. Great. Okay. Hi, Rick. So I really appreciate what you're saying about consistency. And I have diagnosed and medicated wild ADD. And I'm sure. very good at the exercise part. And then everything else is, you know, if it's not an imminent threat or deadline, yeah, it doesn't happen. Yeah. And it creates a lot of chaos for me, yeah. internal chaos. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you could speak to that when you, you have got a it. thing. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> just so you know, too, I have a lot, I, I'm kind of more in the middle temperamentally. I have a lot of heart and respect for people at the more spirited end of the temperamental spectrum because they get a lot of crap from the world. And it's not cool. Uh, I'll put it this way. People like you were really, really useful in hunter-gatherer times and throughout almost all of human history. Okay, it's just tough, tough, you know, my metaphor maybe of being jackrabbity in a world of turtle pens, right? Okay, got it. Uh, so I, I kind of have a question for you. Can you have a consistency of, of mindful presence? Oh, you muted yourself. I'm going to, you just keep yourself unmuted. It's okay. Thanks, Ruby. Yeah. Yes, and a lot of physical output has to happen before I can settle in. So I could do a yoga class for an hour and a half, and then I can go into Shavasana for 30 minutes. Yeah. But if the movement doesn't happen before, yeah, it's just like, I don't know that jackrabbit metaphor you speak of, but I know the feeling of, I know I was useful in society at one point, and now I feel like AI took over and I'm no longer useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean it in a very complimentary kind of sense, in a normalizing sense. You know, some people are more like turtles and some people are more like jackrabbits and some people are kind of in the middle, you know, it's sort of more me, but okay. So one is, can there be a stability of presence of mind? And um, I think that that would be something I would kind of nudge you toward, you know, that you might be useful because you're going to be you. You're going to be you and it's great to be you, right? And like I'm a certain kind of person and I'm not everybody's cup of tea and I'm not perfect in every setting. Okay, so we are who we are. Uh, but this stability of presence, that's something to cultivate. And so how do we cultivate it? Is to enjoy the lusciousness of it. Ah, the reward value of it, right? And to keep replenishing the, the stimulation value of it, the reward value of it. The lush through various things like it's luscious to be present it's luscious to be untroubled ooh doesn't it feel good yummy yummy 
You know, that's the thing. And I don't, do you know this term dopamine depleters? Uh, so basically, and this is a really useful metaphor or science, it's useful science. So uh, biologically, to simplify, uh, there are kind of roughly two groups of people loosely. Probably there's more of a range, but okay. Some people express in their genetically, they have the genetic type that expresses lots of um, dopamine receptors in their brain. So dopamine is the neurotransmitter that tracks reward. Uh, and when dopamine levels drop, people start looking for the next rewarding thing, the next shiny object. Okay. So people with a lot of dopamine receptors are very, are very stimulated by very little. And they can just stay focused for hours on one thing. On the other hand, many people do not express that much, that, that many dopamine receptors, so they need an ongoing trickle of dopamine to stay focused and present and connected because they don't have many receptors. They need a, that ongoing stream to help them stay focused. This is really useful. So you can help yourself to keep that stream coming of reward, right? So that would be one thing I would just talk about. That, you know, because you and you have a sense of them already. You know what they're like when you're just rested and being present. You're you're being there. It's good. Focus on how good it feels and keep exploring the the lusciousness, the richness of that. I, I would really suggest that, and that that would be one thing I'd kind of suggest in terms of that because that will also help you be more consistent in general in your behavior, your actions, and it's really that's. The thing that's important to be consistent about, you know, that sense of uh, being and presence that, that feels really good. That, And then uh, the other thing I just would offer, maybe as I finish here, I I'm sorry, I'm just not going to be able to get to Elizabeth and Brenda, I, I think. Well, I'll just say this quickly. Maybe I'll be able to, I don't know. I'm going to hang. I'm going to keep being energetic. Yeah. Okay. For a little longer. But I'll finish really quickly with you there, Ruby. Um, it's to, as you know, it's to set up structures in your life that help you, that guide you, that channel you. And, um, you know, it's like scaffolding. So you just kind of set them up and they, they keep you in the channel. That, that, I think, is a really important thing to do. And to be kind to yourself about it. Like, I suck at time. I am not good at locating myself in time. So I create all these structures and systems that help me know where I'm supposed to be <laughs> at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. Those would be my two suggestions, especially the first one. What do you think about it? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. I mean, it brings to mind like, oh, that's why I like acting so much and performing because it's so present and it feels so good for my nervous system to be like, there's nowhere else we have to be. It's the only thing we have to focus on. And it's so yeah. rewarding yeah. for me in many ways, but I think that's the main reward is like, oh, we're finally present. Yeah, it's, you know, it's to feel the um, profound peace in the eventless, the neutral. That's something too with your practice is to track the neutral hedonic tone, neither pleasant nor unpleasant, nor relational. And to, it's like, it's kind of like appreciating the spaces between the tiles of this or that thought in the mind this or that feeling or sensation or content. It's, as, it's like there's a, you can be aware of it. Um, there's a kind of space between and which, which feels fertile, right? And in present and, and still. There's a stillness in which activity occurs. And that stillness can feel extraordinarily peaceful and delicious. This I'm going out to the deep end here, but I feel like you're tracking me. And that that's kind of cool stuff to start appreciating. Okay. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like the eventless, the stillness is so delicious. How? It's like Krishna and the gopis. What cows? <laughs> Stillness is so can be so luscious. Anyway, okay, explorations. All right, see you. Thank you very much, Ruby. Super cool. Okay, Elizabeth, I'm going to ask you to unmute. 
Uh, I'm going to be quick, a little quick, sorry, with both you and Brenda, but I'll do it and then we'll be good. Okay. Absolutely. You're fine. Okay. I had a mental health crisis two years ago. So my normal method of motivation was one spike and like, I'm going to prove everybody wrong about me. And two is kicking myself in the teeth. And so I'd like to have another form of motivation besides those two things. Cause that's what I was driven. That was my drive was to make sure everybody that make sure I was like, I am this, I'm, I'm going to yeah. prove you wrong. And I don't know how to do that now. Uh, this is huge. And I appreciate your candor. So spite and kicking yourself in the teeth and you're looking for another way. Yeah. Um, Well, I'm, I'm hearing that you already are leaning into these other ways because you're asking the question and you have compassion for how spite and kicking yourself in the teeth are not that good for you, right? They work, but they're not that great. So that's And that's not good. getting any traction. Y yeah. And being real with yourself about how, you know, the, I think of these as like lesser vehicles, right? They do work but wow, there's a lot of collateral damage. And being real about it and caring toward yourself about it, that's, that's really helpful. Um, if I could ask you a personal question and you always can duck, uh, do you know what it's like to be supportive and encouraging of other people or at least one other being? Yeah. You do? I'm, I'm that, I'm that go-to person. Well, that's I'm everybody's cheerleader, but my own. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a good sign right there. Okay. We're, we're, we're rolling here. We're two thirds there. Um, okay. So one third, you're motivated. You know, you get that the old way doesn't work that well. It's, you know, you're looking for a better way for the same result. A second, um, you have the capacity to be really supportive and, and encouraging for other people. Okay. Well, now we need to bring that capacity to... Elizabeth, all right? And that's where, you know, this process, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be glib about it or quick fixy because it's a process. But for example, I, you know, th this could really touch your heart. If you might get a, some pictures of yourself when you were a little kid and put them out in front of you and imagine bringing you start with a feeling of support for someone who's easy to support, like a friend. You're that go-to for them. Okay, good. You know what that's like. You get into it. You bring up the body memory of it. You know what it's like. And then, whoosh, could you bring it to, to that being, that kid inside you, right? Uh, or you could see yourself as an adult now, and you're bringing that quality to yourself now. What would that be like? And then there are ways, if you're willing to do it, they'd be, you know, good for you. Write that, write a little letter or jot down some words or make yourself imagine, you know, how you could be supportive of yourself in just the same way you would be supportive of another person. And if you start spacing out, you can't do it, have it be the other person. And then when that's stable, that this is a broad general principle of personal growth. You stabilize a way of being, and then you generalize it. You expand it to include the next thing that you want to include. And then when you get bump into difficulty there, go back to stabilizing it. And then it's when it's stable, generalize it again. Apply it to the wider thing. That you, you follow that, yeah. Yes, okay, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, just thinking about looking at the little kid version of myself, it, just, it hits a pain point, you know. Yeah, and that might yeah. not be a good method. Um, but yeah, I can see that because it's like that little kid didn't know, you know. That's right. That's right. It's this fundamental stance that I, I talk a lot about of being on your own side. You know, that's fundamental. And in my, in my book, uh, Making Great Relationships, the first chapter is be loyal to yourself. And I, I go through ways to do that. So in my stuff, you can find quite a lot about this because you're really normal, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time anybody's ever said that to me. 
<laughs> well, it's true. It, yeah. Like, of course, it's hard for you to be on your own side, given the life you've had. Right. It's like I'm just lucky, though, because yeah. life has led me here. I fell into a whirlpool of mindfulness. That's a good thing. But the sense of, of courseness, the, the normalcy, the common humanity of this, it, it's where we start. It's not where we end. You got to do the work. You got to bring energy to it. You know, uh, I think it also, I'll finish on this point. So number one, know what it's like to be supportive of others and then toggle back and forth about exploring being that way with yourself again and again and again. That's a really good path, right? Um, and start tracking the double standard, you know? Like if somebody else mistreated your friend in a certain way, bam, you kick their butt, you know, my butt, you know, you'd be there. Well, but then somebody does that to you, you're like, oh, I guess it was all my fault or something, if that's true. So you, if it's true, so you track the double standards and you start laughing at yourself sometimes and you're growing, you're learning. It takes a while to change in this way, but you stick with it. The other thing to just say this here is um, I could see Aieli and David bringing this point. It's really helpful to internalize healthy allies inside. So most of us have this huge Simon Legree bully inside that's always beating us up because that's what people did, so we took it in. Not good. It's really important to build up these other forces. I call it the caring committee. You know, in my Foundations of Wellbeing program, I think it's the, I don't know where it is, but it's in the first, second, or third strengths that we go through. And if finances are ever an issue for anyone, just ask for a scholarship. We love giving them. It's, for me, a lot of the purpose, Robin Hood wise, is to be able to enable people uh, who can't afford this stuff to get access to it. Anyway, uh, imagine inside yourself almost like a committee or however you do it. And I'm kind of goofy. So I imagine Gandalf, uh, you know, the, the plump fairy godmother. I don't know her name from Sleeping Beauty, uh, friends. But I also think of, you know, fairly direct and blunt rock climbing guides or uh, a guy on uh, – <laughs> You know, he was this great quarterback on my intramural college team when I was a scrawny. I was 16 when I started college. I was really young. So I was kind of a good, you know, I wasn't that great. But man, that guy was great. You know, he, he was, you never wanted to disappoint him. If he threw you the ball, you didn't want to drop it. But he was encouraging. He wasn't mean. That kind of thing. So to think about bringing into yourself uh, healthy guides, healthy encourager, encouragers, healthy cheerleaders. You know, healthy people. My, you know, for me, it was like my friendly guides would say, Rick, stop whining, start climbing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but they did it in a nice way. Anyway, that would be the second thing I would think about internalizing people like me right now who are being straight with you while respecting you. Uh, what's that feel like? Can you be straight with yourself while respecting yourself and aiding yourself? Thank you okay. so much for answering that. Thank you. Oh, totally my pleasure. Thank you for being straight with me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay. Thanks, Elizabeth. All right. Thanks, everybody, for hanging in. 358. Um, Brenda, I'm asking you to unmute. Maybe you'll turn on your camera. You don't have to. Great. You're here. Oh, uh, so I – can you can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I I'm – I'm looking for clarification on the difference between striving and slacking, not to get too hung up. Oh yeah, semantics. great, super good. Okay, and and really, what's the third way? You know, we could say or the Buddha would put it. Unfortunately, I'm going to use a middle finger here between striving and slacking. What's the third way? Oh wait, I didn't do that. What's the middle way? In other words, uh, right between striving and slacking. That's what we're asking about, correct? Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, in both, in slacking, sometimes we just need to take a break. Okay, right? But when we know in our heart that, 
it's not that fulfilling to be just sitting there on the couch eating, you know, potato chips, watching reruns or something, right? Or just scrolling through our social media feed. We just kind of know it's getting kind of stale, right? And we also know deep down inside that our life would be better and we want to give ourselves, our future self, the gift of effort. We know it in our truth, okay? That's that's when I think we're in slacker mode, when it's getting kind of stale and we're avoiding things, really, and we're not meeting our own personal wisdom standards. You know, we got to know inside. We're just goofing off too much. We're getting too high. We're just too many days are going by without really getting much done. We know it. That's slacker. Now, striving in the problematic sense, stressful striving, right? Um, you feel pressured. You feel contracted. There's a sense of insistence, must, got to do it. The hallmarks of that. That's problematic. I know a lot of what that feels like, right? You're stressed. You're not that good. The class I recommended, by the way, Elizabeth, was the Foundations of Well-Being. You can see it on my website. There you go. Foundations of well-being. What's the middle place feel like? I, I call it aspiration without attachment. Or it's much of what I talked about tonight, being drawn toward what is good without, and without a sense of contraction, anger, irritation, uh, not doing it out of fears of inadequacy, doing it from expansion expansion of our own goodness, the expression of what we have to offer into the world. We're actualizing what we have to offer into the world. That's the feeling of it. And often what happens, honestly, is they kind of mingle together. You know, there's a little bit of slacker, I admit it, uh, you know, uh, in my day, all right. There's some contraction sneaking in sometimes, okay. But mainly the through line is a feeling of being drawn toward what is wholesome and good. And maybe you're weary at the end of the day because you did work hard. There's a reason why you look tired. You are tired, but you're drawn. You're drawn toward it. I guess those would be ways I would describe the differences. Thank you. Yeah, and then think about, if I could leave you with this, uh, Brenda, think about what this would look like in your real day. What would it look like not to be a slacker, so-called, but not to be all pressured and stressed and driven while being enthusiastic and productive and inspired and happy. Got it? What would that look like? Productive, inspired, enthusiastic, happy, and diligent. Putting in your time, putting in the time. Yeah, Tell I guess it's just challenging because, you know, you're you're bombarded with so many other people's ideas of what's slacking or what's striving that it becomes kind of confusing to yeah. figure out where you yeah. land on it personally. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I think questions like, what do I really care about? I, Brenda, you know, what matters to me? Uh, you know, when I, when you, Brenda, look back toward the end of your life, what are you going to wish that you had done? What are you going to be glad that you did? The questions like that can be very helpful. Um, you know, <laughs> look at obituaries a little bit. Just like, whoa, you know, not to get freaky about it, but just, wow, what am I trying to do in this life, you know? And um, yeah, but I think it will get clear pretty, I think it will get clear for you, and including in the feedback. Does it feel right, to, you know? Okay, I better wrap it up. And I definitely want to hear from Brenda on my way out the door. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Okay. Great. All right. And the, the other Brenda. All right. There you are. Great. Love it. Thank you, Brenda. 
Dixon. I, yeah, great. yeah, it's just that what this whole thing, though, of all of those awakenings, what I see it all it, as a vessel for somehow is it love, loving yeah. kind of love. And you are so much that. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's thank all you. I wanted to say. It oh, was, bless say you. Something about this vessel that this is and the conduit that you are for all of us for this vessel and i'm just yeah to, tonight yeah you, just so much you've been giving us thank you so mm. much doctor <laughs> oh thank you well you're doctor too and and uh I, i'm reminded maybe this is where we'll just reflect on the way out the door Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching he said uh the next buddha will be the sangha will be the community our community, uh, yeah, I say, our community here, you know, and and may uh, that sense of community and com compassion, you know, uh, the tissue of civil society, the cellular structure of civil society around the world, may it spread, may it spread. <laughs>